Uh, whoops, there was a wrong button. Hello everyone, how's it going? Tim here and this is BXJS Weekly and I just had to start the episode by screwing up. This is episode number 40. I honestly never thought we would get to this um, this many episodes and it is kind of really awesome uh, to get all of your guys' support. It is It has been quite a journey. But uh, going back to the episode, so we got a pretty balanced episode today. We got some articles, a bunch of re relatively big releases and a bunch of really neat libraries and demos, as well as some very interesting and some silly stuff at the end of the episode. So I guess let's just get started and see what we got in store for today, right? So the first article I want to share with you is called An Introduction to CSS Shapes. And it is talking about the uh, CSS feature that I knew existed, but I never actually used it and always was terrified of, uh, you know, kind of even approaching it because it looked very complex. And this article guides you through the whole thing and uh, makes you um, understand how to use them and actually explains them in a really, really simple manner. And it's actually really easy. And uh, if you didn't know, CSS shapes allow you to essentially shape your contents, shape your text, shape your divs and other elements around a specific other element um, in by using CSS essentially, right? So here's an example on the screen, you can see the text is actually shaped around the circle. And then the div is generated using the circle uh, shape outside um, parameter in CSS. But that's not the, like this is the simplest example, right? There's, you can do uh, custom shapes, you can do ellipses, you can do half ellipses, and there is insane amount of complexity that is essentially included into that. And um, the article does a very good job of explaining uh, how do you tackle all of that and turns out is not actually that hard. So if you were interested in CSS shapes and shaping your content or text content, I guess around um, variously shaped things like uh, there's a lettering example somewhere here, there you go, or, you know, images or whatever, then this article will give you a really good start. So do check it out quite highly recommended. Next article we got here is from the site blog, it's called serverless SSR, a case study, and it talks about Essentially, it compares the existing um, UI frameworks like React, Vue, uh, I think there's like as well Preact and some other um, in how they handle server side rendering and how would they fare in the function based environment as in, you know, function as a service because the site now to platform is now essentially a function as a service platform. And uh, the faster your app is, the better it is. Uh, going to be price wise and performance wise, right? So this is what you want to optimize for. So they decided to check um, what kind of uh, frameworks. Uh, um, okay, let me rephrase that. They, they decided to compare the different frameworks, specifically view lit HTML, react react and VHTML to see how fast are they going to work in the functional environment in um, with the server side rendering, right? So there's like additional write up on uh, the whole setup technology approach and measurements and everything. And there are the results, uh, not just on the cold start, which is quite important, but also on the throughput, which is also I would say quite an important parameter. And uh, yeah, the results are kind of um, interesting to put it, uh, you know, mildly, let's call it this way. Uh, view is actually the uh, slowest on a cold start, but has the most throughput uh, and the biggest uh, lambda size, which you know, is like what what I guess what you would probably expect. But then again, you know, view is undergoing the major rewrite right now. So maybe we're going to see a drastic change on the next version. Uh, React is somewhere in the middle. So it has like a 13 millisecond 14 milliseconds cold start, which is not terrible, but still quite slow. And then the throughput is yeah, a few hundred requests less than view, for example, but uh, still quite impressive. And then yeah, VHTML, which is the essentially uh, lightest version of what you could name the server side render HTML or render fra or UI framework is uh, 0 0.7 millisecond cold start, which is insane. And then you got well lower throughput, but that's, you know, fine, um, and a pretty small bundle size as well. 
There are some interesting thoughts in the article. So if you are dwelling and you know, you're working with or thinking about going into the uh, functional way of building as in function as a service uh, way of building applications and using server side rendering for that, do check it out. There are some interesting thoughts here and some interesting data. Uh, we'll be curious to see this benchmark expanded to more frameworks because I mean, you know, react react and Vue are not exactly the only ones that support server side rendering. But maybe we're going to see that uh, at some point later. I'm yes, they did open source it on GitHub. So maybe it's just get pull requests with uh, other frameworks, it will be really interesting to see the whole picture of the whole ecosystem essentially. All right. Next article we got here is from the V8 team. It's called speeding up spread elements and uh, talks exactly about what you would expect. It talks about speeding up the spreads. Right, so we had the spreads in V8 for quite some time now. And um, it's actually been way slower than just about any other alternative as far as I remember. This is why a lot of people relied on Babel and pre-compiling it so that it actually would be faster, right? So the V8 team uh, finally looked at it and uh, increased the speed quite significantly. So the article itself is really cool as always. Uh, it not just talks about what is spread, but it also explains why spread is actually slow and how you can or how they actually did improve the performance, right? Which uh, is yeah, so you, as you can see here, the performance improvements are just insane. It is crazy. And there's also additional improvements that come with uh, v 872 which including the uh, stuff like uh, improving array from improving, um, I believe there is as well some map improvements, but they are not mentioned in this article, if I remember correctly. But yeah, uh, if you are again curious about the V8 um, engine innards and the workings and how exactly do they handle the speed ups of specific V8 features, then do have a look. This article is incredibly interesting to read and there is a lot of very uh, cool, um, intricate details about how exactly the V8 handles the spread operator. So do check it out. Next article we got here today is called You May Not Need Axios, Fetch API to the Rescue. And uh, the disclaimer in the front of the article says, this is not an attack on Axios, rather an advocacy for the Fetch API, which has become quite capable. And indeed, it's basically a comparison of uh, how you would do pretty common things that you could do with Axios request or you know, any other pretty large and heavy libraries, uh, like super agent got whatever, by just using fetch, uh, which works perfectly fine in the front end. Um, hey, Donna, welcome to the stream. So essentially, it's sort of a collection of recipes, I guess you could say that show, hey, here's here's how you actually get JSON from a URL using fetch. And here's how you get custom headers. And here's how you do a course. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Donna. Thank you for the donation. He has just seen it. This is really cool as always. Thank you so much for your support. Um, okay, continuing. Yeah, so basically, it's a collection of recipes. And if you are still relying on a heavier library that um, does requests for you in the front end, do make sure to check out this article and maybe evaluate fetch for your use case because it will essentially remove one of the dependencies you got here, right? So if you're using access request, R2, super agent, got or whatever, it is additional dependency, it is additional size, right? So additional kilobytes and fetch is already in the browser. So like in the Node.js, it might not be as uh, important, I guess, but if we're talking browsers, Fetch is actually really good and you can replace pretty much any of those libraries uh, for it. It's like, it's quite easy to use. So do check this list out. Right, next article we got here is finding photos on Twitter using face recognition with TensorFlow. Let me make it a bit bigger. And uh, it talks about, so uh, yeah, the author's use case was like, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna find all the photos from the conference I was on with the conference participants, right? And he was like, okay, doing it manually is a pain in ass. So I'm gonna write a bot that would find the tweets and then extract the photos that actually have people in them. And he also decided to do that using the function as a service. So it's not just some continuously writing thing, but actually the functional serverless functions um, that are doing this. And there is like, you know, the task itself is not the simple one, but uh, using it as a serverless function makes it even trickier. So there is a really interesting write up on 
how he actually used TFJS and the TFJS based uh, face recognition library to first of all detect faces and then how he optimized it for performance because you know functional uh, service uh, serverless functions are gonna be fast right so you gotta be fast for a startup otherwise you're gonna pay a lot of money and there's yeah there's a lot of comparison on you know how he optimized uh, for the cold start then how he optimized for the warm starts the caching and all that kind of stuff so if that sounds interesting do check it out it's a really cool use case i personally found it to be very interesting to read about all of that stuff and uh yeah, it's just a really neat use case right up. All right, uh, next article we got here is a crash course on serverless side rendering with ReactJS, Next.js, and Amazon Web Services Lambda. So yeah, as the title says, this is a de deep dive into the serverless side. I, I mean, that's, I, I don't know if I like that term. It's essentially a server side rendering within the serverless functions, right? So it's a deep dive into server-side rendering on Amazon Web Services Lambda specifically using the serverless framework and Next.js. So if you are thinking of doing a React app that uses Next.js and you wanted to deploy it on Amazon Web Services Lambda to make it serverless, then this is actually a really good tutorial, essentially, very in-depth, uh, walking you through every step of what you would do, what you need to do, all the configs, all the examples are here. So once you read it and once you follow this through, you will be able to create your own Next.js app and deploy it to the Amazon Web Services Lambda. Yes, there's a bunch of uh, pretty intricate details that you have to know when you work with those services uh, that you wouldn't otherwise think about because you know serverless functions do bring some things with them that are a bit tricky to handle. So. Again, you know, if you're interested in the whole serverless side of things and maybe you wanted to work with Amazon Web Services and didn't know how exactly to do that with uh, Next.js and React, do check this article out. It will get you started in uh, just a few minutes. It's actually quite straightforward. Okay, continuing, we got build Rails like, uh, let me try again, uh, build Rails like console in Node.js. So um, yeah, the author talks about the Rails console. Uh, Rails has this a really nice REPL that allows you to um, interactively work with just about anything, right? So this is a really, really cool thing. And while Node REPL is already quite powerful, um, there is some limitations, right? So while you can require modules, it won't actually expose them in the global scope. So you have to, would, would have to re refer the module there's some basically minor annoyances, especially when you work with a uh, larger projects, right? So uh, this guide walks you through using the REPL module, which is the part of the node core, which by the way, I did not know about before reading this article that allows you to build your own custom REPLs that uh, essentially can do whatever you want, right? So in this case, they just expose the uh, module uh, contents through the global so that you can actually just refer to them through the REPL, which is quite nice. Very straightforward, very simple, but uh, essentially it's a yeah, it's a tutorial for this REPL module, but it's really cool because I never heard about that module before. <laughs> and it looks like I should uh, investigate a bit more because it looks really neat. So if you were looking to make your own REPL with a custom globals, then do check it out. This guide will get you started in no time. All right, next thing we got here is a setting up Webpack 4 for a project. This is essential a uh, Webpack 4 tutorial that guides you through a very basic setup, uh, you know, using Webpack dev server, ES5 to, uh, sorry, ES6 to ES5 using Babel, CSS code, SVG, file loaders, and TypeScript, right? So nothing super complex here. So if you already know how the Webpack works, you won't really find anything new or incredible here. If you are still confused by the Webpack, if you're still figuring out how the Webpack works, then this tutorial will uh, give you basically everything you have to know about the Webpack to get you started. Continuing, we got a new blog post from Dan Abramov on his overreacted blog. This time around, it is called Why do React Elements have a dollar dollar type of property? And uh, it's essentially a very detailed post that answers the question of why is this dollar dollar type of property is in the React elements if you actually expect them, or, sorry, inspect them, right? So when you run this React create element, you will create this object that will have a bunch of keys and one of them is this dollar dollar type of. 
So if you are curious, once again, this is a very in-depth um, look into the how React works internally. So if you're curious about that, definitely read it. It's a really good blog post and very you know cleanly explains of uh, why is that important? Why is this symbol there? Why do they use a symbol actually? And how do they fall back for the older browsers that don't support symbols, for example? Um, if you are just using React and not curious at all about how it works, then, well, there's nothing really of importance for you here, but I would still suggest reading it because it's just really cool and a really well-written blog post. All right, continuing, we got sitting your database with thousands of users using Next.js and Faker.js. I would call this a tutorial on Faker.js. So this is, if you never heard about it, Faker.js is a library that allows you to generate random data essentially for um, primarily testing and mocking purposes. And Next.js is a ORM uh, for Postgres. I think it's ORM or is it just like the, I don't remember if, it's, if it was ORM or if it was just the sort of API. Uh, here's the question. Let me just quickly check it because I am, um, sometimes there's just too many. No, okay, Next.js was just an SQL builder. So it was just like a abstraction over the SQL. So it's not RM, it's just SQL builder. So, right. So this article walks you through configuring Next.js on a very basic level. You know, like we have a Postgres, we configure Next.js to connect to it, then we create a table and it writes some data, right? And then you need some sort of a data to test the whole thing. So it can be either some, you know, performance testing, or it can be just unit testing. And I mean, for unit testing, I guess it's not important to have that many users, but sometimes you just need to have a lot of users to make sure your code works correctly, right? So Faker.js in this case allows you to generate random data. And uh, there is a lot of methods that it supports. So there's stuff like, you know, addresses going down to a very specific things like, you know, states, latitudes, countries, you have the commerce, you have the companies, databases, dates, finance, hacker, whatever that is, uh, there seems to be some sort of a hacker vocabulary thing, helpers, uh, images, you can even generate the image URLs that are, I think, I'm not sure, if, I'm, they're probably not working, but um, hey, uh, yeah, avatars, lorem ipsum words, paragraphs, so basically it can generate just about everything you might need in a real app, right? And this article walks you through using Faker to generate users, right? So which, which is essentially a very simple way uh, or very simple thing to do is nothing super complex about that. But uh, yeah, it is a very helpful thing. Yes, definitely. If you haven't heard about Faker.js, uh, definitely write it down. It's a very helpful thing, especially when you have to mock data or generate random data that should conform to some sort of a standard like, you know, user emails or addresses or something like this. So if you never heard about Faker, do check this article out. If you already know what Faker is and uh, how to make it work to fill your database, then well, you won't really find anything new in here. All right, continuing, we got let your JavaScript variables be constant. This is essentially an introduction to the let and const in ES6 an explanation of how do they differ from var and when, sh when should you be using let and when should you be using const and if the const is immutable or not and all the other subtle intricacies of the, you know, the new uh, keywords essentially. There are some opinionated things here, but I think it's overall pretty strong article. And if you're still confused about let and const, then do have read. It will explain about 95% of the things you got to know. And the other 5% is usually what you have to figure out yourself. <laughs> so yeah, if you're still confused about let const and var, do check it out. This might uh, explain all the things that you did not quite get yet. All right, continuing, we got this year in JavaScript, 2018 in review and NPM's predictions for 2019. Uh, exactly what it says, there's a blog from the NPM team and it talks about a sort of outlook of the what happened in 2018, how did NPM change, how did JavaScript change, what happened, what kind of uh, things JavaScript was used for, what kind of languages do people use in addition to JavaScript and there's like a bunch of other insights 
that all are quite interesting but those are essentially you know like looking back sort of thing and uh, mostly from the data they get from the npm itself they also have some additional npm predictions for the next year that are kind of curious they are um they are saying there's going to be a new framework next year that's probably going to replace one of the current tools, which is an interesting prediction. I don't know. May, I, it would be quite cool to see something completely new and, um, you know, something that would basically make me switch from one of the tools I'm using right now. But um, yeah, we'll see. There's, so React is going to be still dominant, but going to slow down, which makes perfect sense. And they're also saying you'll need to learn GraphQL. I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, GraphQL is a really neat technology, but I don't know. I still see it as a very niche thing and it doesn't really as doesn't really fit everything as much as the rest does. You know, it has a very specific use case niche and doesn't really go out of that niche too much. But um, yeah, we'll see. They also say that a lot of people using TypeScript, so likely you're gonna, someone on your team is gonna bring in TypeScript next year, which makes perfect sense. I mean, TypeScript been getting more and more popular insanely later, so it's like, yeah, but uh, yeah, if you're interested in more data, do check the article out. There is some interesting things in addition here too. Okay, next thing we got here is a bunch of articles related to the same old event stream incident. We already talked about it quite extensively on the previous podcast, but um, this time around, there's more sort of thought out articles that talk about what can be done to make JavaScript ecosystem more secure, right? And there's a more thought through more weighted more argumented points uh, and I tend to agree with majority of them so if you are curious about what can be actually done to um, kind of try to prevent at least the event stream like incidents then do check it out there are some interesting thoughts but ultimately they don't really solve the problem completely as you know as it is a very tricky problem and this is exactly what the next article talks about. It's called de facto closed source, the facts, uh, I'm sorry, the, the case for understandable software. And uh, it talks about the fact that, well, you know, the thing is that, yes, we had this whole thing with the event stream and um, uh, what happened is that it's it's not, um, so let me, let me try to rephrase that. Um, hey, Bagawa, welcome to the stream. So what the article talks about is we must make software much simpler, right? So let's, let's just, uh, the, the companies, uh, okay, so the other, um, um, my, my thoughts is a mess right now. Let me try this again. Right, so the article essentially talks about, first of all, we might make, uh, we must make the software much simpler. Second of all, the companies who base their services on open source must support that open source, which makes perfect sense, right? Um, the another interesting point the article raises is that uh, so somebody hijacked that package and published it with a Bitcoin stealing thing or Bitcoin mining thing inside of it, right? So the thing is that this is not exactly illegal. So what just just like the thought experiment that the author offers offers is what would happen is the if uh, the legitimate owner of the package was to insert the Bitcoin miner in the package and just publish it as an update as a way to monetize his open source software, right? It's not illegal, it's not against any rules. He can very much do that, right? It's his package, he can do whatever the hell he wants. And this is a pretty much legitimate way of monetizing it, right? So why do people, like, okay, stealing Bitcoin is a different question, but uh, just mining it, it's like, yeah, I guess it's gonna cost you in the server price, but this is a legitimate way of monetizing it. So what's, like, unless uh, unless we see more companies supporting open source ecosystem, we're gonna see a lot more of weird stuff happening, especially in JavaScript ecosystem, because there is so many people and so many packages out there. So ultimately the only solution is yes, indeed, making software simpler and uh, getting the companies to support uh, the open source they're actually using, right? So it's like, it's very important. Mining without notice is kind of not great. Uh, that is true, but it's not illegal as well, right? So the thing is that, yes, it is not great. It is absolutely a terrible move and it's gonna cost people who use your, or who use the specific open source software 
pay a lot more for the servers, especially if they're running on something like functions in Amazon Lambda, right? But it's still like you can do that, right? It's not. It's, it's like it's your package. There's nothing preventing you from that. It's still it's perfectly legal. So it's a it's a reasonable monetization strategy. So it's like yeah. I mean, yeah, here's here's the interesting thing. So the author talks about that if if implemented correctly, as in, for example, the mining would be just limited to one core and then even maybe less, you know, like 10% of the CPU or something, then this might go unnoticed for years unless someone starts reading the source code and just notices that there's actually a miner in there, right? So it's it's like we actually got those event stream and other things because the people who wrote malicious code actually screwed up and it was detected quickly through the errors. But if you write it correctly, if you maintain it, it's going to be very freaking hard to detect anything like this. One of the points he raises in the article is actually, he's talking that he runs multiple Linux distributions in his home, right? And there's no way he's going to be able to read through the source code of the kernels on his own ever. And it also makes perfect sense. Like, you know, what's stopping of like the Linux developers, uh, one of the, I don't know, maybe maybe not the kernel developers because there's like a pretty large team right now, but what stops the distro developers, like one of the distros, just putting the Bitcoin miner by default in there? It's like nothing really, you know, and it's, it's absolutely reasonable as well because it's their product is, yeah, it's like, it's a very interesting point raised and uh, there's also like he offers a relative like I guess way to solve this. So basically if you're curious about the whole topic, do make sure to read this article. It's not extremely large, but it raises a very interesting points and offers an interesting solutions to that. So do check it out. It's really cool. Okay. Uh, now we are coming to the tiny sized awesomeness. And the first one we got here is Thank you, next, an introduction to linked lists. Uh, linked lists is a very simple thing, right? So if you are still confused about them or you never heard about them and want to learn about them, this article, which is just a couple of pages long, will probably be the best introduction to linked lists that you will read ever. It is really good and I highly recommend looking at it if you don't understand linked lists. It also uses uh, pop culture references that make it even more amusing. So. <laughs> Do check it out basically. All right, uh, why I accidentally opened this, we don't need that. Uh, yeah, next thing we got here is Microsoft is making the web better through the open source collaboration. And what they mean by that is that Microsoft is actually open sourcing Microsoft Edge. Not just that, they are gonna be moving edge core from their own chakra core to the WebKit. So it's actually, oh, sorry, to the Chromium. So it's actually not gonna be um, chakra core anymore, but Microsoft Edge on the Windows and on the, I, th I guess on, on pretty much any other platform is gonna be Chromium now, right? So it's gonna be Chromium based browser. Um, the interesting thing is that if you didn't know, they have the uh, Microsoft Edge for mobiles and it's been based on Chromium for quite some time now. So they did, they decided to not port their own uh, Chakra Core engine to the mobiles and just take Chromium there. On one hand, this is kind of awesome because that means that uh, we have one less engine to worry about. On the other hand, this is less competition. So it's like, uh, you know, Feels a bit weird. Uh, on the other hand, Microsoft does says that Chakra Core is not going away and they will still use it in a bunch of places. So it's just the edge itself is gonna be switching to Chromium. So it's kind of interesting to see how all of that will develop because Chakra Core did have some really neat features. Um, unification of the browser. Yeah, kinda. Uh, like we still have Firefox that have a completely separate engine, right? And it's really like, I like seeing more competition because it pushes people to do better, faster, more performant things, right? So like once the Chrome engineers develop, uh, let me try this again. Once the Chrome engineers deliver better, faster engine, the Firefox guys are like, hey, wait a second, we can do this even better. And then the, you know, the Chrome guys go like, wait a second, we can do it even better. And then it just goes, you know, this is how we got the, browsers we have right now because they were just competing for the more performance, faster, better experience. And this is awesome. 
And now essentially, we are just gonna have one less public engine, I guess, the one that is user user facing. And uh, yeah, there can be some da downsides to that. And even the Mozilla, uh, I think like one of the chiefs at Mozilla was unhappy about that because there's less competition, which makes perfect sense as well. But I'm really curious to see how all of that will develop. So I am, I'm kind of, you know, like one part of me is a bit sad that we're going to have less competition, but the other part of me thinks, okay, so now that you're using Chromium, maybe at one point they just add Electron right into the windows so we can have a shared Electron environment. You know what I'm saying? Like this is gonna be freaking awesome if that works out. But yeah, it's, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Like it's, it's really like the major pickup from this article is that Microsoft is open sourcing their browser. Just think about that for a second. Edge is gonna be open source. Windows browser, part of the Windows is gonna be completely open source on GitHub. Like this is the new Microsoft that I absolutely love. And this is the takeaway that I'm gonna, you know, close this article with. <laughs> All right, next thing we got here is the work in progress pull requests in React. Uh, that is a base implementation of a React Fire. If you forgot or didn't know, React Fire is this uh, new um, React DOM implementation that is supposed to modernize it. It has a bunch of things they wanna address, including renaming class name into class, which is my favorite thing about it, <laughs> probably. There's as well some additional things. So if you're curious, uh, there's a link to the original ticket that describes the work. Do check it out. But that means we're likely going to see React Fire released in the next, uh, well, basically in 2019, which is kind of great. I was, uh, I was afraid that it might be way longer than that. But uh, there you go. So pretty neat. Okay, next thing we got here is plug and play and tink. A pretty comprehensive write up from the uh, one of the maintainers of yarn on uh, the plug and play specification and how it differs or aligns with Tink and the workings of it. So you know how exactly they compare, what exactly happens when they resolve stuff. And yeah, so this is, there's some, some pretty interesting points in here. So if you are curious about the whole Node.js without uh, Node modules thing, which is, you know, plug and play is already shipped, Tink is still in development. Do check it out. There's some very interesting points and I'm curious to see how all of that will develop. All right. Next thing we got here is open sourcing Node Publisher. Introduction to a new package that is called Node Publisher, as you might have guessed, that is essentially streamlining the Node modules publishing for you through these .release.yaml config where you can specify whatever the steps you need to do before or after or during the release, right? And uh, then you can just run one release command and it will do everything for you, which is quite nice. And I know that there's more than one tool like this already, but uh, this looks pretty nice. And if I remember correctly, this is from the Zendesk guys, exactly, um, which is, you know, a relatively large company. And uh, yeah, check it out. Maybe this is what you are looking for. All right, next news we got here is a tiny announcement from the Vasm JIT guys. Uh, they managed to run Nginx um, compiled to WebAssembly without any modifications in Vasm JIT. So if you forgot or if you haven't heard about it, Vasm JIT is the kernel mode WebAssembly uh, that runs on Linux, right? So it's a uh, allows you to run WebAssembly right on a kernel level, which at the time sounded insane, but now they are saying they can run um, compiled Nginx without any modifications, which is freaking crazy when you think about it. So um, yeah, quite excited to see where this project goes, but this is kind of insane news. And uh, this is, I, I don't even know if they like using the latest WebAssembly that uses the threads and everything of as the current version, which is even crazier. But anyway, it's, yeah, it's, it's great. It's awesome. WebAssembly have been delivering some insane things lately. Okay, next thing we got here is IntelliCode for TypeScript and JavaScript. Uh, so this is, this is one of those things that, again, make me super excited about the Microsoft in, in 2018 and, uh, you know, hopefully in the next years. 
Uh, at Build 2018, Microsoft announced the v Visual Studio IntelliCode plugin that is capable of providing AI-assisted auto-suggestions. So it's not just IntelliSense, but it's actually IntelliCode. So it's not just suggest the methods, but actually uses AI to suggest your methods in a smart way. And they are bringing that to VS Code via VS Code extension, which is even, even, even more awesome. Like VS Code already had incredible auto suggestion for JavaScript and TypeScript. And now it's going to be even better because it actually is going to be context dependent. So here's an example. If you type if map and then type a dot, it's not just going to suggest the map methods, but it's actually going to reason that you're typing within the if closure, right? And probably want to check something. So it's going to suggest the method has as the top suggestion, which is just really cool. And um, like the possibilities of uh, like, you know, I'm just thinking of what you can do with an AI like this and the AST predictions. It could be so much better experience. Like it's I'm, I'm really curious to see how all of that develops. But the fact that they are releasing this for free for VS Code as an extension that you can just go right now and install it for your VS Code is incredible. So yeah, just check it out. This is really great. All right, next thing we got here is TC39 binary AST proposal to improve JavaScript performance. Um, this is, I guess, just a reminder that this thing is still alive and kicking. Binary AST proposal has been around for quite some time, but maybe you haven't heard about it. This is a short write up on what it is and how it can improve the performance of JavaScript along with, you know, working with WebAssembly. So do check it out. It gives you a pretty good outlook at what JavaScript will become or might become, I guess, in uh, upcoming years. And I, you know, I, I think always bet in JavaScript has never been a better phrase. <laughs> okay. And the last thing I got here is the 2018 JavaScript ecosystem survey from NPM guys. So if you're using JavaScript, if you're using NPM, if you're using Node, please go ahead and take the survey. It's not extremely long. But um, it will provide a pretty good outlook at the ecosystem. So, you know, the more answers we get, the better data we will have in the end. They will, as usual, share the results. So I'm quite looking forward to uh, going through those in one of the podcasts. So please do answer the survey and, uh, yeah, let's see how it turns out. All right, now we're coming to the releases section. The first release, um, or actually two releases we got today, is Node version 11.14 with a bunch of added things, including console and util stuff. Um, and I think there's like nothing that is super major here, at least from what I've uh, seen myself. Maybe I'm just missing something. But yeah, it's just, you know, like sort of minor release with uh, nothing um, of worth of highlight, at least from my perspective. And then we got the Node.js version 6.15.1 LTS. That is basically, um, Slower is uh, DOS uh, mitigation. Uh, and if you're still on six, you should upgrade immediately. If you're not on six, I mean, if you're still on six, you should probably upgrade to 10 at some point because it's just worth it. Uh, but yeah, there you go. Okay, next release we got here is uh, one of my favorite ones of the week. It is Babel version 7.2. It introduces, first of all, private instance methods in classes. So we had the hash uh, syntax here. I, to be honest, it looks quite nice, actually. I do not dislike it. And my favorite thing, we got smart pipeline operator parsing in it. So you can now actually use smart pipelines, which allow you to substitute hash for uh, any function call, essentially for the argument that will be passed from the previous call, which is freaking awesome. And I cannot wait to start using that in my functional code because pipelines are awesome and I want to just use them everywhere, basically. <laughs> Okay, next thing we got here is GAS code shift 0.6.0 um, with added TypeScript support and upgraded Babylon and some other stuff. If you never saw it, JS code shift is a code mode toolkit from Facebook guys. It is quite awesome. So if you need to run code modes, do check it out. Uh, this is, might be what you were looking for. Next thing we got here is React Redux version 6.0, which adds the support for Context API and React uh, 16.4 and a bunch of other uh, things. It does have some breaking changes, so be careful with that. Uh, but yeah, seems to be a pretty solid re um, release. So if you're using Redux, do check it out. Next release we got here is uBlock version 1.17.4. Um, first of all, you might be wondering why the hell is this on the JavaScript podcast? Well, 
let me just give you two points. One point is that I really like uBlock Origin and it's a really great product. And uh, if you're using any other new, uh, ad block, you should switch to uBlock because it's just straight up better. Now let's talk about why is it better? Here's an interesting bit. So uh, Mr. Gorhill started switching his code as in the you know algorithmic part that actually does the blocking and filtering and everything to WebAssembly. So um, he, he brought the WebAssembly bits that now do um, speed up the things for him, right? So there's even a benchmark page that can uh, show you how much faster the WebAssembly is gonna be. So in this case, he's using the WebAssembly bit for host name lookup. And I believe the speed increase is something like 100 fold or something, if I remember correctly the numbers, but you know, feel free to run the benchmarks yourself and check it out. So um, yeah, if you are using uBlock Origin, you're running ad blocking on WebAssembly now, which is <laughs> kind of awesome. So yes, do check it out, it's pretty awesome. All right, uh, now we're coming to the demos and libraries section. And the first thing that I wanna highlight is the package phobia thing that um, I've been using a lot lately that allows you to check the cost of adding a new dependency to your project in a very nice way. So you essentially just type uh, something like got.js and you get a size, which is uh, you know gonna be gzipped or just install size. And then you get it tracking over version releases and stuff. And it is really handy. Like, you know, you can just see what is going to be the package size and version. And uh, they do it on demand, I believe. So if the package was not there, it might take some time to actually uh, collect the data and show it. I'm not sure if ExoFrame will even work because it's actually a command line package. But uh, I've tried it anyway. So if you're working a lot with the packages, do check it out. It is a very nice website to get the sizes and just track them over the version releases might come in quite handy. Here's the difference, by the way, between uh, node, node fetch is actually quite big. Okay, that's surprising. I guess because it's node and not minified, right? So there you go. Okay, uh, next thing we got here is, yeah, this one is my favorite of the week probably. It's called Sneaker Generator and it's literally a neural network that runs right in your browser and that generates sneakers for you. So um, I will not run it right now. It does take quite a long time to run. So around 10 minutes on i5, as it says here. Uh, my computer is saying it took about like five or six minutes, but it's still like, you know, it's a very, very long time. But once you execute the code, you will actually be able to see 64 pair of shoes right in your browsers, which is crazy what you can do now with machine learning. <laughs> but yeah, really cool demo. Check it out. Uh, I be believe the source code is available on GitHub as well. So you can check that out if you're interested in generating your own sneakers. Next thing we got here is engine 262, which is an implementation of ECMAScript 262 in JavaScript. Uh, ECMAScript 262 is basically the latest spec. So what is the ES 2018 or whatever it is right now. And uh, this is the spec implemented in JavaScript itself. And the goals are spec compliance, introspection, ease of modification, and they don't care about the speed essentially. So this is just to check the specification and just to make sure that it actually, you know, you can write the code and then evaluate it using the engine. So it's JavaScript inside JavaScript, because why not? Uh, so if you're curious how you could do something like this, or maybe you wanted to play around with it, do check it out. Seems to be like a really neat project. All right. Next thing we got here is Debugtron, a command line tool to debug electron based app, uh, as in production binary, not the electron app itself. So you can run uh, any app using Debugtron, any Electron app, and it will start a debugger, attach it to the app and allow you to inspect and play with um, Electron app from the browser, from the browser dev tools uh, in any way you want, which seems like a pretty neat thing to um, maybe even reverse engineer stuff. Uh, I mean, it's it's not hard to do yourself actually, but just streamlining the experience is pretty neat. Uh, majority of Electron apps actually have the debugger still enabled. So if you hit Command Shift I, you know, like in the browser, you will actually get the console in there. So it's not always needed, but uh, yeah, it's a pretty neat tool nonetheless. All right. Next thing we got here is pkpkg.com, a searchable catalog of modern ESM modules packages on NPM. So yeah, the reasoning is quite simple. Uh, 
modern modules means faster, smaller JavaScript bundles because you got the tree shaking and everything, right? And uh, this is sort of a subset of NPM that you can search for um, packages that have the module field in them. So if you want to search for something like uh, filter, whatever, you will um, I'm probably have JavaScript blocked. There we go. You will actually get, yeah, the packages that are ES6 and more and have the module field so you can actually use them in your uh, code, which is kind of neat. So, you know, if you're using modern code, do check it out. Next demo we got is Prime React UI components for React. That is a really big UI component library that has just about anything you can imagine from autocompletes to sliders to tri states to a bunch of different buttons to maps to trees to I don't even know like there's even uh, upload components, 100 different menus, even charts and messages and scroll and progress bar and whatever you can imagine all is in here in one nice package with theme support and looks really neat and if i remember correctly um let me just go all the way back it was mit licensed if i'm not mistaken yes it is mit licensed so pretty neat package if you are looking for all-in-one uh, ui components for react then check it out maybe this is what you wanted Next thing we got here is reinspect use Redux dev tools to inspect use state and use reducer. A really neat thing. So, you know, we have the use state and use reducer hooks now in the latest alpha of react, right? And they're coming to the release quite soon. Uh, but they don't obviously work with the Redux dev tools, right? Because this is not Redux This is actually just hooks. So somebody decided that they should work because it makes perfect sense. And he wrote this uh, reinspect thing, which you can just wrap your app around it and it will automatically enable inspection in Redux DevTools, which is kind of great. <laughs> so this looks amazing, to be honest. So yeah, check it out. Next thing we got here is FOI, a simple, lightweight and modern task runner for general purpose. Uh, so this is, yes, yet another task runner. So if you are using um, any of those still, I, I don't know, I think it's been a few years since I've used any task runner at all, aside from, you know, bundlers like Webpack and uh, other things, even though I'm not even using them directly lately. But uh, if you are in need of task runner, do check it out. This one looks quite nice. Maybe you want to upgrade to something like this seems to be written in TypeScript, which is uh, always good. But yeah, check it out. Okay, next thing we got here is Misa, or I guess, I, I'm not sure, I guess it's called, it's read Misa. It's a dependency free stream utils for Node.js. So it was released uh, quite shortly after the event stream incident and exactly what it says. It's a dependency free stream utils for Node.js with quite a bunch of methods. I am, uh, I probably will suggest using my favorite library called Highland.js, which I believe is also dependency free and it has like 200 more methods uh, and different utilities. So let's just have a look dependencies. It is yes, it is also dependency free. So check out Highland if you need any streaming things. It is quite great. I absolutely love Highland JS. Okay. Next thing we got here is JS PDF client side JavaScript PDF generation for everyone, a PDF generation library that you can use in your browser. This is insane. But yes, this is a thing. And you can actually just use it in your browser right now. <laughs> Maybe you wanted that. So check it out. Next thing we got here is Yalm. Uh, yeah, I cannot read that YAML full. This is what I want to say. It's a YAML based HTTP client code generation. The idea is that you write a YAML spec, which is uh, seems to be custom spec, actually not the something. Um, what's the name of the what's the name of the spec that is used for documentation and testing? I, I'm keep forgetting it. There's this um, HTTP endpoint definition spec that is quite widespread, but I keep forgetting it. This seems like a custom one, but essentially you can write it and then we'll generate the um, code for you from it. Which again, I think this is exactly the same. What was the name? Is YAML HTTP spec? What was the name of it? God damn it. Uh, Swagger, right? This is what I'm talking about. We already have the Swagger, right? So this is a pretty established 
specification for open APIs. And there is like a whole ecosystem of tools around it, which can generate code from the spec for you. So um, yeah, what thought it was your package with that name? Come on. Yeah, I can't even read that name. Why would it be my? Oh, because Yamalite. Okay, I get it. That's a terrible joke. I know I don't take it. <laughs> All right, uh, let us continue. Next thing we got here is Rewire Framework. It is a minimalistic package that allows you to work with observables in React, essentially, and powers a bunch of other packages. Looks quite nice, so you know, if you're working with observables and wanna have observable state, I guess, do check it out. It is quite nice, I guess. I haven't tried it. It's also written in TypeScript, so yeah. Next thing we got here is Fork.js, a JavaScript lightweight object validator. Um, exactly what you would expect. You can define rules and validators and then test objects, types, whatever, classes using them. Seems to be pretty straightforward. Not sure how it compares to existing validators like Joy or everything like this. There is no comparison as it most frequently happens with libraries like this. But uh, check it out. Maybe you were looking for a library like this in your work. Okay, next thing we got here is Plazar.js, modular framework built with enterprise in mind. Um, now that's a weird one because I looked at it and to be honest, from the quick start, it looks like Backbone.js, which I used like 10 years ago, I think. It is, yeah, it looks a lot like Backbone.js and I don't know, I'm not sure what's, like there's no, this is the weirdest thing about all those super new frameworks, libraries or whatever, right? They release the thing and they say, like, hey, this is like the thing built with enterprise in mind. And 90% of time, there is no comparison to existing frameworks. Like how, why would I use that instead of what I'm using right now? Where is the comparison? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages, right? Those things are all there, but the author didn't write any about them, like any, any info about this, which feels a bit weird, but maybe you were looking for a new framework for JavaScript that looked like Backbone. Then check this one out. Maybe this is what you want. All right, next thing we got here is Relax.js, a vanilla JavaScript plugin that implements a dynamic parallax scrolling effect without dependencies and apparently very easy to set up. So, yeah, that's this like look, looks very straightforward and uh, produces a quite nice effect without any lagging, to be honest. So if you wanted some parallax, do check it out. Uh, no dependencies as a set, very neat. Maybe this is what you were looking for. Okay, next thing we got here is Grant.js, all with middleware for Express, Core, and Happy that has over 180 supported OAuth providers, which is insane. I don't think even Passport.js have that many. So if you are building an app with Oath and wanted to include every possible Oath provider, <laughs> probably this is what you're looking for. So do give it a shot. It seems to, yeah, it literally seems to have everything you might have. This probably has anything that has Oath and is relatively popular on the internet. So yeah. All right. Next thing we got here is project guidelines, a set of best practices for JavaScript projects. And this is... Yeah, essentially guidelines for writing projects, uh, quite sensible ones. I mean, I would say they are quite opinionated and uh, if you are already building projects for quite some time, you won't really find anything super new in here. But if you're just starting out and if you're building your first projects and if you're still confused about some of the things and how to structure things and how, you know, how do you do things here and there, do check it out. There are some really good pointers. Don't take them as an absolute truth. Uh, they're very opinionated and there are some things that can be, you know, that I personally do different. Like there's the code structure. I, I don't know. I always put my tests in a separate folder. Like, yeah, I guess it's fine. But uh, I don't see anything wrong to be honest with this structure. Like, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, grouping it in, in, in uh, logical is actually way better to be honest. Yeah, okay, that makes some, <laughs> like, like, okay, let me just say, don't take it as an absolute truth. Do check it out. There's really good guidelines in here. Some of them are very opinionated, but if you are just getting started, we'll give you a good uh, starting point, essentially. All right. Continuing, we got um, 
interesting and silly stuff left. The first thing that I want to highlight is code to vec It's a demo for the new paper published by the uh, bunch of people. I believe there was like guys from Facebook along with some people from the US universities. Uh, come on, load up. It is a scientific paper, so expect, um, I know it's actually uh, Facebook AI research and Technion, whatever that is, I guess it's a company. So they published a paper on code to vec uh, If you're familiar with um, anything NLP related, you probably heard about the word to vec which is an approach that converts words into vectors that you can then use in machine learning, right, for example. And um, what they suggest is converting the code to vectors to be used in machine learning, right? So you can actually, you obviously take the codes, uh, convert it to AST, and let me just allow this. Uh, you convert it to AST, and then you can actually convert that AST into vectors to then do something with them. For example, you can uh, predict stuff from function names, which is, you know, the, the stupidest, simplest thing you can imagine, or you can try to break combinations of things, or you can make analogies, uh, which is kind of neat. And um, this probably is a missing link to a thing that I wanted to do for quite some time. So I had this really crazy, stupid idea about a year ago, Whereas like, so we actually know AST for a function, right? And we know AST for the tests for this class or function. So what if we could train a neural network that would try to predict the test that you would need to write for your own function so that essentially it would write unit tests or, you know, integration tests for you, right? Um, at the moment, I ended up figuring that, okay, it will be a bit either completely impossible or very hard because the functions can be of arbitrary size. So your AST tree is actually not fixed size. And you know, you're going to have problems throwing that into a neural network, right? But if you have a vector instead of AST, you could actually do that. So maybe I will come back to this research and see what I can do because the whole field is like the idea of auto generating tests in my opinion is, is really cool. So if I could just forget about writing unit tests at all and just write like integration end to end tests, that would be amazing. And this might be the missing link. So I, I, I yeah, this is like my plan is to try to read more about that and see how exactly it works. There was some, I, I saw the discussions and people were like, okay, this is not exactly precise and there's some like problems here and there, but yeah, it's, it's really promising. Uh, anyway, continuing, we got the Parametric Press website. Uh, now the website itself is like calls for proposals. I believe this is a, either a journal or something among those lines, but this is not what I want to show. They have this really cool idea of having parametric article, right? And if you want full details, you read the whole thing. And then if you don't have time, you say, I just want TLDR. And depending on how much time you have, you can pick the length of the article. This is also an absolutely awesome way of presenting content. And I want this as an automated extension to my browser. You know, I want to be able to say for any article, give me a TLDR. I don't have time to read that right now. I just want the bullet points. Um, I believe that in next five to 10 years, likely we're going to be able to automate that, but, uh, yeah, the whole idea is just awesome. Like, this is great. I love this. So yeah, do check it out. Maybe you're also doing some parametric press related things. Um, this is exactly what the um, project is about. So if you are working in the fields, do um, check it out and maybe submit your papers there. Maybe, maybe this is what you were looking for. Okay, next thing we got here is Flutter 1.0 release. You might be wondering why the hell am I covering this on JavaScript podcast? Well, so first of all, Flutter is quite curious on its own because it sort of stemmed out of a Dart, which was supposed to be the JavaScript replacement. In the first place, at least this is how I understood it all the time. I know that some people claim it's not supposed to be a JavaScript replacement, but it always looks for me like they developed it to replace JavaScript. And then it didn't fly and they just sort of branched out into a completely different thing. So now we have this Flutter, which allows you to build mobile apps, right? So this was the original goal. Now, why am 
highlighting this on the podcast is because they actually moved Flutter beyond web. So Flutter 1.0 allows you to do custom rendering. And one of the custom renderers they have is a web-based implementation of a Flutter runtime that allows you to render Flutter apps right into web. And they also had some workings going for the desktop. So essentially soon you will be able to write cross-platform apps in Flutter that will work anywhere starting from mobile and go into the web and desktop, which sounds really cool. And uh, you know, Flutter looks actually quite promising. Uh, yeah, hey Mandaputra, yes, now it is stable. Welcome to the stream. It actually looks really cool and I, I don't know, I probably will play with it at some point. So do let me know guys if you want me to live stream all of that stuff because I never used Flutter before. I've heard about it and I've, you know, I've checked it out a couple of times as in looked at the docs and stuff, but I never actually had any hands-on experience. So it will be curious to check it out and maybe stream a bit and see uh, what we can build with it. But yeah, if you are curious, do check it out. Now version 1.0 and uh, seems quite promising. All right, continuing, we got awesome actions repository here, a created list of awesome actions to use on GitHub. Uh, if you haven't heard, GitHub released, uh, or I think it's still in closed beta actually. So they have those actions thing that you can now use in your repos. I believe they granted me access to my uh, primary account for now. Hell if I know how to use them actually, I never tried before. <laughs> okay, you know what, let's not do that now. But uh, basically there is now a repository that collects all the best actions out there. So you can do like Node.js actions toolkit or get like sleep action. I don't know why you would want that, but I guess it's fine. There's also actions like deploy to Netlify, deploy to Azure or use Jenkins file or deploy a playlist to Spotify. I, <laughs> I guess that's the thing. Does anyone here deploys their GitHub to Spotify? That that's an, that's, I, <laughs> Okay, I what what? Why would you do that? Playlist CSV. Okay, I get, yeah, right, okay, fine. Yeah, so if you want, you can have your playlist and CSV and then deploy it to Spotify. I I, I guess that's the thing. All right, so next thing we got here is terminals r.sexy website that um, is essentially a collection of really cool things for terminal starting from shells, go into terminal emulators, go into packagers, go into text editors, go into tools, communication, and a bunch of other things. And uh, if you're using terminal, I would highly suggest looking through those tools because there are some really cool things that I have not seen before. And some of them are that I'm basically using on pretty much daily basis. Like one of my favorite ones is like stuff like TLDR, auto jump, and uh, exa, for example. TLDR pages are amazing, by the way, if you've never seen them, you can uh, get a bite-sized tutorials or manual for any command line tool by typing TLDR tar, for example. Are you tired of trying to remember how to package or extract stuff in tar? Then you can just TLDR tar and you will get all the commonly used things. This is a community maintained thing, so it's really great. Do check it out. Yes, it, it's available for just about any platform you might imagine. You can install it using NPM. You can install it natively using, uh, I don't know, Homebrew or binaries. And there's a C Sharp client. There's an Elixir client. There's a Go client. There's clients for everything. There's even Android client if you want it. It is great. Just install it and try it out. Uh, this is just a highlight of what this list consists. There's a lot more things uh, like really cool ones here. So do check it out. If you're using terminal, you might find one or two tools that are really good. Okay. And to close this whole thing down, we got a very funny, but sad comics um, about the, what do you want for Christmas? I want a dragon, be realistic. Enough donations to support my open source work. <laughs> what color do you want your dragon? This is, <laughs> Like this meme is still funniest, but saddest thing I've ever seen. And yes, relevance to open source is just like, oh man, come on. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. Um, right, this is actually all I have for today. So as usual, you can find all the mentioned links in the GitHub. 
The link to the GitHub is in the description as usual uh, in channel description if you're watching on Twitch, on the YouTube if you're watching a VOD or wherever you're listening it should be there in the description. Uh, feel free to join our Discord server if you want to talk more about JavaScript or if you're having problems and need some help. We are always uh, more than happy to help there. Once again, thank you guys very much for your continued support. Once again, Donna, thank you so much for your donations. It's been incredible. And uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions or suggestions or any things that I th you think I might have missed today, just feel free to throw them right now into chat. If not, we can wrap it up here and uh, just go play video games or do other things. Uh, I don't know. There's like there's the Path of Exile Betrayal coming out or came out actually. I want to play that. And there's a bunch of other things that I I I want to do things. Yes, yes. I want to play some video games. All right. I guess good for me. Yeah, okay, cool. I guess I guess no other things work out news for you i mean this yeah that's the point of the podcast the thing is i'm reading all of those things anyway during the week right so why not talk about them i do enjoy talking about stuff maybe a bit too much but okay all right guys <laughs> seems like uh no questions no suggestions so once again thank you very much for watching thank you very much for your continued support have an awesome rest of the weekend and I see you next time. Uh, maybe I'll stream some video games a bit later today. So I see you later.